And then we pick up the second graphene sheet, and amazingly, this forms this very regular more potential, you know, more structure that I described before. Yeah? And after doing this, we just do regular nanofabrication of devices, which you know, again thousands of groups around the world can do. But the tricky, the key step is this thing that I described. Okay? Now. Once we have done our fabrication, what we end up having is you know, twisted bilayer graphene, which is encapsulated with this hexagonal boronitride dielectric. We contact with source and drain electrodes so that we can apply a voltage and measure a current. And very importantly, we have a nearby metallic electrode. We call this a gate electrode. This metal plane and the magic angle graphene form a parallel plate capacitor. So if we apply a voltage between the two plates of this capacitor, we can vary the charge density in the graphene electronically. Okay? And that's key. Now, before I show you actual magic angle graphene data, let me remind you how does conductivity or conductance through a graphene, through regular graphene, monolayer graphene, look like. Yeah? So if you measure conductivity versus charge density in regular graphene, if your Fermi energy is deep into the valence band, you have lots of holes, so it conducts very well. If your Fermi energy is deep into the conduction band, you have lots of electrons, so it conducts very well. And if your char Fermi energy is at the charge neutrality point or direct point, you have very few charge carriers, so you conduct poorly. So the conductivity of graphene versus charge density looks like this you know, V-shape. And that is, again, measured by thousands of groups. Yeah? So now let me show you how it looks for magic angle graphene. So these are actual data of the conductance versus charge density for magic angle graphene. Okay? As you can see, near charge neutrality, near charge density, you still have this V-shape. The system remembers it's made of graphene. Okay? But then you have this non-monotonic behavior, and it's a complicated pattern of the conductance. Okay? Let's see if we can understand what's going on. So remember, this is the electronic structure of energy versus momentum for graphene. Okay? From charge neutrality, in these flat bands, from charge neutrality, if I want to reach this gap here, I have to remove four electrons per molar unit cell. Remember I told you the four would appear? Okay? Because of a spin and valley. From charge neutrality, if I want to reach this upper band gap, I have to add four electrons per molar unit cell. Okay? So when I remove four electrons or I add four holes per molar unit cell, my chemical potential sits here. This is a regular single particle insulator. This is a single particle electronic structure. So 
if you are in the middle of a band gap, your system should not conduct electricity, and indeed, the conductance is zero at four holes per mole unit cell. This is easy to understand single particle physics. If we, on the other hand, add four electrons per mole unit cell with respect to charge neutrality, our chemical potential goes here in the middle of another band gap, also single particle insulator at four electrons per mole unit cell. That's easy to understand and expected. What came as a big surprise is that if we add two holes per mole unit cell, my chemical potential is in the middle of a band with a very high density of states. The system should want to conduct very well and be an excellent metal. What happens is actually that the system has zero conductivity, is an insulator. Okay? That thing you cannot understand in a single particle physics picture, okay? and it's a correlated insulator state. The same thing happens if you add two electrons per mole unit cell. Again, the system wants to conduct electricity. There are plenty of electronic states at infinitesimal low energy for, it to, for the system to conduct electricity, or there should be in a single particle picture, but they are not. Okay? And the system is an insulator. This behavior only happens if the twist angle between these two graphene sheets is in a very narrow range around 1.1 degrees. Basically, between 1 and 1.2 degrees is when we observe this type of behavior. Now, what we, you know, what came as an even bigger surprise, okay, is that if you put your chemical potential here around this correlated insulator state and you add now a few holes, you know, remember this is for two holes per mole unit cell and you add a few more holes, what you get is superconductivity. Okay? The system now turns into superconductor, from an insulator to superconductor, just adding a minuscule amount of electrons to the system. Okay? So in a phase diagram of temperature versus charge density, this is actual data, okay? you have a region of correlated insulated states corresponding to two holes per mole unit cell, you add a few extra holes and you have a superconducting dome, you add a few electrons and you have another superconducting dome. Yeah. Now, when my students showed me this data, okay, it reminded me immediately of the hundreds of times you know, that I have seen this type of phase diagrams. Okay? These are the phase diagram of the high temperature cuprate superconductors. Let me actually flip these axes so that they correspond to the axis here. Now it's correct. Okay? So, in a high temperature cuprate superconductor, zero doping means one electron per copper per unit cell. You have a mod insulator, a correlated insulator, which is a mod insulator. If you add extra holes, you have a big superconducting dome. If you add electrons, you have a smaller superconducting dome. Yeah? In magic angle graphene, at two holes per mole unit cell, same thing happens at two electrons per mole unit cell, you have a correlated insulator state. If you add holes, you have a big superconducting dome. If you add electrons, you have another superconducting dome. Now, there's a big difference between these two pictures. This is a theoretical phase diagram. Okay? In order to populate this with actual experimental data points, you have to grow hundreds of crystals, a different crystal for each of these points in the x-axis, with different chemical composition, often different materials classes, okay? and you have to do hundreds of cool down and experiments, each of them with a different disorder realization. This map is in a, obtained in a single device with a single disorder configuration without any chemical impurities because we control the doping electronically, just dialing a gate voltage in a voltmeter, uh, in, in a voltage source, and it takes just a few seconds to take. Yeah, well, actually, for this type of diagram, a few hours to take, yeah, but in a single cool down. So, you know, this attracted a lot of attention. You know, let me tell you a little bit about it and the development since we announced our discovery. So we posted this, you know, we announced this at the, March, at the APS March meeting in 2018. And you know, we posted the paper the same, the same week that, that we announced it. And then what I call the theory tsunami came, you know, which is, this is just a short list of the papers that appear within weeks. Okay, of uh, our discovery. By now, this list has actually several thousand papers. Okay? So people were trying to answer this question, what is the origin of the correlated insulator state and what is the superconducting order parameter? So as you can see, all kinds of predictions have been made okay, with all letters of the alphabet, you know, S, P, D, D plus ID, S plus P plus D, P plus D plus F. So, you know, basically I, I you know, I used to work, I mean, well, I, you, know, I, I, you know, the community where I came from, graphene, I used to say that the, the angular cone of disagreement between theorists was about 20 degrees, you know. 
in this correlated physics community is actually 360. You know, in fact, it's four pi it's in all directions. The disagreement, you know, so it's it's, it's really uh, quite spectacular. You know, all kinds of other parameters have been suggested. We do not know yet the answer. Okay, it turns out to be a relatively complex problem to analyze theoretically to the system, as you may not be surprised because it's a strongly correlated system. And we still investigated the answer. We're learning a lot, but we still don't have an answer to these questions. Now, together with, with this interest from the scientific community, the popular press also became very interested, you know, and there were all kinds of articles, you know, and, and with all kinds of very cool pictures and animations. You know, I wish I knew how to design these things, you know. But anyway, the, you know, People became very curious to the regular community. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the experimental development since uh, the paper was officially published in, in the two papers on April, in April 2018. So let me tell you a little bit about what has happened since then. So the first thing that happened is that we have reproduced our own results. You know, we have made many more devices. Believe it or not, that doesn't always happen, so it's good when you're able to reproduce yourself, okay? Not, not necessarily obvious that it happens. So we have made many, many more devices, you know, and by now we're in fact starting to map this thing, the critical temperature, you know, at optimal doping as a function of twist angle, this new knob in condensed matter physics, the twist angle between two crystalline structures. Okay, and as you can see, there is a superconducting. You know, there is a dome, but as a function of this twist angle too. Now, much better than you reproducing yourself is when other groups reproduce your results, okay? Only then it becomes real science, obviously, okay? And by now, you know, many, many groups have totally independently reproduced our results and even extended them in very interesting directions, okay? So the first two papers that reproduced our results were a collaboration between the group of Corridina at Columbia University and Andrea Young at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Not only they were able to reproduce our results, but extended them and they were able to tune the superconductivity with pressure, which proved that it is really dependent on this interlayered tunneling. Okay. The second group was the group of Unity Ethicals at Utah uh, in, in Spain, where they were able to see additional superconductivity with pressure. of graphene with zero angle between them, regular bilayer graphene that you could take out of graphite, and other two layers of bilayer graphene with zero angle, and we can place them on top of each other, twisted at the magic angle, okay? And then what you have is another correlated system, different from magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. And in particular in the system, we have an additional knob, transverse electric field. Now we can put 
two of these metallic plates, one at the bottom and one at the top, apply opposite voltage and have a transverse electric field. Okay? And that tunes the electronic structure, and in particular tunes the strength of the correlations in the system. So this picture is a little bit complicated. All I want you to notice is that you know, this two electrons per moire unit cell is along this dashed line, and you can see that you know, red means insulator. At some point, insulated states appear. Those are the correlated insulated states, and they are tunable depending on the the strength of that electric field. The system has interesting magnetic properties which are different from magic angle graphene, for example. This system, however, is not a superconductor. Okay? Now, lots of, you know, the scanning probe microscopy community was immediately, you know, mesmerized by these moiré patterns and started to look at them and start, you know, to look, have a, a closer look microscopically at what's going on in these systems, okay? So, in a, in a famous week uh, in 2019, there were, no, in 2020, there were three papers, you know, published at the same time, the same week in Nature, you know, by the groups of Abhay Pasupati at Columbia, Ivan Dre at Rutgers, Nali Gizdani at Princeton. There was a fourth paper by Stefan Natsperch. Let me twist it here so that give it to you proper credit. All basically reporting very similar results, okay? Which, let me just focus here on the paper by the Yazdani group, you know, this is again a complicated picture. All I want you to notice is that these two lines are very close together here, very close together here, and further apart here. Turns out in STM, you can, in scanning talent microscopy, you can investigate spectroscopically the system as you vary where your Fermi energy is. And what they saw is that when they put the Fermi energy far away from the flat bands, the system displays single particle physics behavior with narrow bands, but when you put the Fermi energy in the flat bands, interactions renormalize the bandwidth, okay, which was a direct proof of the very strong interacting nature of this system, okay, and all papers came up with similar uh, conclusions. Now, another thing that was very important is that, you know, the communities of ferromagnetism, anomalous hole, and even quantum anomalous hole physics in the Simpsons, which, which brought the role of topology front and center, you know, to more quantum matter. In fact, one of my, you know, because Joyce is, is, you know, in, 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 in this, uh, participant of this community, is that this more quantum matter field has meant the merging of several condensed matter communities that did not talk so frequently to each other before. Okay, so on one hand is the 2D van der Waals materials and heterostructures people, like people like me that worked on graphene. Then you have the strongly correlated materials people, people that worked on cuprates, nictites, heavy fermions, and then the topological condensed matter physics community, people that work on quantum and fractional quantum whole states, topological insulators, valve semi-metals, all three communities come together in this more quantum matter platform. Okay? But soon after our discovery, together with my theory colleagues at MIT, we predicted that there will be these you know, nearly flat churn bands in more superlattices, or describing various type of more quantum Simpsons and the topological properties of these systems. There was you know, also a lot of other theoretical work around the time. And six months later, the group of David Goldhaber Gordon at Stanford, they measured this very large anomalous hole effect, a very large transverse, you know, whole voltage at zero magnetic field, showing that there was ferromagnetism in this system, and it's a new type of ferromagnetism called orbital ferromagnetism. And again, about six months later, the group of Andrea Young at UCSB, they showed actually the quantized anomalous hole effect in the system, so quantum hole effect at zero magnetic field in this more platform, in a platform that does not have any magnetic impurities or magnetic element. Again, this is just carbon. Okay? So, We've been busy over the past year, year and a half, going to the next generation more quantum matter. You know, I call this more magic 3.0, okay? So earlier last year, both, you know, two groups, the group of Philip Kim at Harvard University and my own group, we published in the same week back-to-back -back papers in Nature and Science showing the discovery of a second robust more superconductor, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. Okay, it turns out to be much more tunable and a stronger superconductor and a more interesting superconductor than the bilayer case. Okay, let me just give you a couple of highlights. So this system realizes ultra strong coupling superconductivity, also the bilayer case. And by this I mean the following. So how do we compare superconductors you know, as physicists? One way is to say how high is TC, and that's, you know, obviously very important, if, if nothing else, for applications. But from a physics point of view, what we typically, the way we typically compare superconductors is by 
in a log log plot where you have the critical temperature and the Fermi temperature to look where the superconductors sit in this map. Okay? So let me show a few lines here. So if you take conventional superconductors, for example, aluminum, they tend to sit near this corner. Okay? They have relatively low critical temperatures, in the case of aluminum, for example, 1 Kelvin, and gigantic Fermi temperatures, like 100,000 Kelvin in this case. Fermi temperature is the same thing as density normalized by some factors. So we can put 2D and 3D superconductors on the same plot. Okay? So aluminum, given the gigantic density of electrons that it has, it superconducts modestly. As you go towards this purple band here, as you go diagonally in this direction, your superconductors tend to become more and more exotic. In fact, in this purple band, we have all of the unconventional superconductors. The cuprates, the nictites, the organics, the heavy fermions, they all have relatively large critical temperatures compared to the density of electrons that they have. So magic angle twisted by layer graphene and tri-layer graphene are here. Okay? They are among the strongest coupled superconductors. In fact, magic angle twisted tri -layer graphene is the strongest superconducting in the world. Okay? If the cuprates had the same coupling strength of magic angle to the trilayer graphene, they would be well above room temperature superconductors. Okay? So we do not understand yet exactly what is the reason, but it seems that in these more superconductors, the superconductivity is exceedingly strong. Okay? And one of the aims of the community is trying to identify what is the key ingredient that makes these superconductors so strong to see if we can design or, or synthesize other superconductors at regular atomic densities that will have ultra high temperature superconductivity, critical temp uh, temperature super for superconductivity. Okay? Now, these superconductors are also very different because they are topological, as I mentioned. They have topology in their electronic structure, okay? So, you can't necessarily extrapolate that to other materials, and the whole community is still trying to understand whether the role of topology is also a key ingredient for this. Now, this magic angle to the trilayer has also a very special thing, which is the following. Let's think for a moment about what is the effect of a Zeeman magnetic field, of a Zeeman effect on a conventional superconductor. Okay? And the reason why we can think of this is because these are two-dimensional superconductors. You know? So if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, you induce vortices and so on, and you destroy superconductivity very fast. But if you apply an in-plane magnetic field, there's no, in principle, there's, uh, there's no orbital effect sideways because it's a two-dimensional superconductor, so you can explore at what is the effect of a pure Zeeman field. Okay, or at least in a very nice way. So if you take a conventional superconductor, we have spin spin jet cooper pairs, so in kind of state of spin up and down. Okay? Now the cooper pairs are bound by something known as the cap. Okay, so in this new theory, this is related to the cooper pairs. So in human effect, there's the cooper pairs that pop together with the cooper pairs that are going to be Thank you. 
We also have regular boronitide dielectric, and then, because it's an insulator, we cannot measure transport through it. What we did is we placed a graphene, a graphene sheet on top, okay? And we made what is known as a ferroelectric field effect transistor, where the graphene channel is going to conduct electricity, and it's going to have different resistance depending on whether the ferroelectric has polarization up or down, okay? So, if you measure the resistivity of this graphene on top of this parallel stack by layer boronitride, Remember, conductivity is V-shape, so resistivity, which is one over conductivity, has this peak structure, okay? So if you sweep your voltage in one direction, you have the red trace. If you then switch, sweep the voltage in the opposite direction, you have the blue trace. You see this, this hysteresis. This hysteresis is typical, you know, the typical signature of ferroelectric behavior. Okay? In fact, you can study this continuously in a, in a you know, top voltage and back uh, gate voltage you know, plot, you have this transition from BA type of domain behavior abruptly to AB type of domain behavior, and you can reverse course, and you have this hysteresis. Occasionally, we're able to catch a domain wall as, it's, as, it's, as it zips through the contacts, and we see the bias stability. Yeah? So, now, that was for perfect parallel stacking, but we can also stack it at a small but finite angle, okay? At a small and finite angle, what you have is, similar to magic angle bilayer graphene, you have regions of AA stacking and regions of BA and AB stacking. But now, BA and AB have opposite electric dipoles, okay? So we have a more, if you want, anti-ferroelectric material, okay? <coughs> now, if you apply one electric field, you increase one type of domain at the extent of the other, if you apply the opposite electric field, you do the reverse, okay? So, indeed, if we fabricate devices, in this case, it's a 0 0.6 degree, okay? Just a very small angle between the two bilayer, you know, between the two boron nitride sheets, we can measure this resistive state, which now transitions gradually from one to the other because we're gradually changing that domain structure, okay? As opposed to abruptly when the angle is zero degrees, okay? In fact, can we have a direct visualization of those moray patterns and ferroelectric moray patterns that I told you about? Indeed, we can. We can use a technique called piezoelectric force microscopy, and we can measure directly the electrode dipole moment in these structures. And you can see here in the phase and amplitude image this beautiful honeycomb structure. You can put it on top of these, and you can see the honeycomb pattern of electric dipole moments up and down. Okay? This is something that works at room temperature. I don't know if you follow too much the engineering, you know, electrical engineering uh, community, but ferroelectrics for neuromorphic computing and other applications are sort of the latest rage, you know. This thing actually, you know, everything that I do, I've done in my life pretty much was 4K and below, but here's one thing that works at room temperature, you know. So it's kind of interesting. You can switch it many, many, many thousands of cycles, and it works very well. Now, this trick that I showed you, this crystal symmetry engineering in boron nitride, there's no reason why we cannot apply this to the hundreds of hexagonal bipartite lattices that we have, okay? In particular, for transition metal dicalcogenides, okay, materials where you have a metal atom and a calcogen atom, you know, uh, two of them, okay? These are regular semiconductors, and you can do the exact same trick, okay? The bulk material has 180 degree alternation between the layers. We can stack them parallel to itself. They have opposite electric dipole moment. So we made this with all the transition metal dicalcinides, the semiconducting ones, WSC2, MOSC2, WS2, MOSC2. All of them are ferroelectrics. All of them work at room temperature, and they are semiconductors. So you can do logic and memory in the same device at once, okay? So with this, we basically double with this work in the past year, the number of two-dimensional ferroelectrics that we have using these more, you know, structures and, and this, you know, uh, stacking engineering. Now, in the last minute, let me tell you a little bit uh, about what is going on in, in, in neighboring, I mean, what, what is coming forward in terms of what some of the community thinks and also what's happening in neighboring communities. So, as I told you, you know, we've pretty much realized almost all phases of condensed matter already just by using very few simple ingredients, graphene, hexagonal boronitide, some twisted transition metal dicalcogenide, these are all very simple elements, not the simplest, in fact, that we have, simple uh, compounds. So, but we have hundreds and hundreds of two-dimensional materials which 
by themselves in unit, in single unit cell form, can be very exotic, like the high temperature group of superconductors, they can be exfoliated in monolayers. We have ferroelectrics, which are in the unit cell. We have magnets and quantum spin liquids, sensitive quantum spin liquids, which are in the unit cell. So imagine all the possibilities to discuss this and then and create a more structure with the